Hello everyone, welcome back to the Clara CFO Group channel. Today we're going to be talking to Kelly Paxton, who is a certified fraud examiner and a private investigator. Kelly has written a book all about embezzlement and specifically talking about embezzlement in small micro doses or um, what we like to call pink collar crime. So um, this is really a type of crime that not a lot of people talk about, but it's super important as you're trying to operate your small business and especially as you're growing and you're trying to figure out how to start outsourcing things and getting more people to help you in your business. We want to make you aware of this type of crime because honestly, this happens more often than anybody wants to really talk about. So I have brought Kelly on because she literally wrote the book <laughs> on pink color crime and um, we're gonna talk about that here in just a second. So let's go ahead and welcome Kelly and she's going to share lots of wisdom with us today. All right. Well, Kelly Paxton, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me and helping spread the word on pink collar crime, AKA garden variety embezzlement. <laughs> okay. I like it. I think that's where we should really start is uh, what is pink collar crime? Can you help us understand what it is and like why, why we're talking about it today. Sure. So um, white collar crime is financial crimes, but think of, you know, insider trading, Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, Ponzi schemes, and then pink collar is a subset of that. And okay. it has nothing to do with gender, except women do it really well. But um, the term was popularized in 1989 by Dr. Kathleen Daly, and it's low to medium level employees primarily women who steal from the workplace. So okay. it didn't even get popularized until 1989 where white collar crime, the term came around in 1939. So 50 years later, but I like to call it garden variety embezzlement, but people refer to me as pink, not, okay. not the singer. <laughs> <laughs> um, Gotcha. Okay. And the, the reason it's called pink collar crime is, is just because it's trying to make a differentiation. Like you say, it's not about gender. It's about position, right? Yeah. And yeah. so there's a famous criminologist who actually passed, but he said this in 2012, and this was, you know, obviously way before COVID he's like white collar, pink collar, people don't wear collars to work. And so, but it's the way that we like, you know, white collar, we're thinking, you know, executives sitting in offices, pink collar, mm -hmm. you know, 90% of bookkeepers are female, according mm -hmm. to the Bureau of Labor Statistics. So those are much more likely in the past to have been female dominated positions. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. I mean, we're not talking about the Enron level or the Bernie Madoffs here. We're talking about Barbara, who's doing the books for you know, such and such construction company for the past 30 years. These are the types of crimes that we're seeing that are are starting to be, um, I guess we're, we're hearing more about them. They've always been happening, but we're hearing more about them now. And that's really what we're talking about today, because a lot of the people watching this channel are small business owners or they're actually accounting professionals themselves. And so what we want to bring to this attention is like this stuff is happening and we're seeing it happening but it's not talked about all that much. So that's why we're having this conversation today. And I do want to just tell everybody, um, there is a book, Kelly wrote this book <laughs> about pink collar crime. So um, this, I it's, it's already thumbed through like pretty heavily. I have been reading it and rereading it and kind of going and looking through it multiple times because this is, not only does it have really, really good stories um, about stuff that's actually happened in real life, but it also has a lot of just good tips for business owners on, you know, what to be aware of and maybe how to make sure that we have our, our blinders off, that we are aware of these things because nobody ever thinks it's going to happen to them, right? <laughs> Optimism bias. We don't think cancer, they say only 10% of people think cancer is going to happen to them. It's 30%. We think that, you know, we're smarter, we pay better, it won't happen to us. And it's, it's a true bias. Mm. But the one thing that I like to say, the difference kind of between white collar and pink collar, think of it as the difference between Wall Street and Main Street. Embezzlement mm -hmm. affects Main Street. And that is, you know, small businesses, medical offices, you know, dentists, three out of five dentists get embezzled. Um, it is the crime on Main Street. 
-hmm. And it also is the crime that you are more likely to be affected by instead of a violent crime. We're all scared of, you know, someone coming in and, you know, breaking into your house. That is less likely to happen and to affect you than pink collar crime. Hmm. And, and these crimes that are being committed, sometimes they're not actually um, prosecuted. Sometimes people are not going to jail for them. It's just kind of hushed up. Right. And then that person might move on to the next company and do this thing again. Is that, that's what I was picking up from reading your book. So they say, and statistics are really, really messy in white collar crime, any type of financial crime, but they say only 15% of all embezzlement cases get turned over to law enforcement. The number one reason is shame and humiliation. And so I'm on Mm -hmm. this like soapbox lately of Mm -hmm. let's not victim shame when someone has an employee that takes advantage of them. But Mm. you can see it in Facebook when a media outlet puts a story on Facebook, you know, so-and-so got ripped off a half million dollars. You will see the comments like, I'd like to have a half a million dollars that I could just have walk out the door. People are kind of mean about it. So as a business owner, you feel bad. And Mm. in embezzlement cases, they're like, what were they doing? Playing golf too much? Were they not paying attention? Like, you know, Mm. let's not do that. So, right. Because, because they won't go to law enforcement and then that person will hit another business. Right. Yeah. And I, I think that that concept, I mean, let's put ourselves in the, in the, um, maybe in the shoes of the business owner, um, why they would potentially feel that way. Because, um, you know, I hear, I work with directly with small business owners all the time. And so these are large growing, I mean, they're small businesses, but they're growing, you know, and, Things get picked. I mean, activity picks up and you start to get into a place where you can't oversee every single little thing. And so you start to put your trust in people and you start to say, well, I need to outsource this. I need to outsource that. I need to have somebody else who's keeping an eye on this for me because I'm getting really busy and I can't I can't look at the big statements on a regular basis. I can't do the bookkeeping myself or I don't want to do it. And I don't even recommend my business owners doing their own bookkeeping most of the time. But as you get into that space and your business grows and grows and grows, you start developing a layer of trust with your employees, which is helpful. But that same trust is where we can get like, I guess this is where that that level and ability for pink color crime to exist starts. It does that or at least part part of the reason. So I'm known as the fraud hashtag queen because I love hashtags. And one of my hashtags, unfortunately, that I just did a presentation for audit professionals last week. And I was like, which hashtag do you like best? Hashtag trust is not an internal control. And Mm. the thing is, is people's lives change. And if nothing else, COVID has shown us how much people's lives have changed. So you get like, say, an orthopedic surgeon who has always made a very good living. And all of a sudden, you know what? They can't do operations because a lot of hospitals shut down elective surgeries. Mm -hmm. And so then their employees don't have work. And so you don't think of people like that ever, you know, and I know you've had Jeff Grant on about, you know, PPP fraud and EIDL fraud. We don't think of those people ever doing it, but we have the fraud triangle, which is opportunity, pressure, and rationalization. All three have to be there. Mm -hmm. And as accountants, accounting professionals, you think of just shut down the opportunity, you know, but you also have rationalization and pressure. So what if you have an employee whose spouse is now laid off, who had a really good job and COVID got rid of it, or whose kid became sick or whose parents became sick due to COVID? They have financial pressures they have never felt before. So it's kind of like this, you know, you have the triangle And we've always said, just control the opportunity. It's really hard to control the pressure, Mm -hmm. but you can control rationalization a little bit. And I will say to your business owner clients, tone at the top is so incredibly important. If you don't want your employees to steal, don't do things that they think are gray. Mm, Yeah. So I'll explain tone at the top. I came from an audit background and that was one of the first like things that we were taught about was this tone at the top. 
But I think that's not something that most, especially most small business owners may have never heard before. So what is tone at the top? So it's, it's your employees looking at you, you doing the right thing. So, Mm -hmm. you know, I'm going to say in small businesses, a lot of small business owners say, well, it's my business. I can do with my money what I want to do with my money. And I give this example a lot is say the small business has to go to a trade show and gee, the trade show is in Anaheim, California, and they decide to take their whole family to Anaheim and make it a Disney vacation too. They come back from the vacation. They did go to the trade show, but they spent another four days at, you know, the Grand Californian. And then they come back and they hand their Black American Express bill to their bookkeeper, their accounts payable person. And that person, Barbara or Billy, is like, so I know you took, you know, the family. How do you want me to split that? Mm -hmm. And the business owner is like, just pay the bill. Now, mm. now, Barbara or Billy doesn't know if the business owner is going to take an owner's draw at the end of the year to adjust for it. But mm-hmm. I'm going to say a lot of them are going to assume that that $20,000 vacation, they did not pay taxes on. It's a business expense. Mm-hmm. And now Barbara or Billy, their kids text them from work or from school and say, hey, I need the last $200 to go on that you know school field trip. What goes through their mind is my boss just wrote off $20,000 and it's not legit. Like what's 200 bucks. And I had a woman who stole from a medical clinic. And when she was confronted, sure enough, she said that to the business owner who happened to be a woman said, I'm turning you into the IRS because I know you're paying your kid's car and your home utilities through the office. The woman Mm. called her bluff, but then she ended up going and stealing somewhere else And I said to the detective who was working with the business owner, she's going to try and get her way out of this. I call that the get out of jail free card. Mm -hmm. Those low level employees, they know everything you are doing because they're paying for it with the accounts payable. Yeah. Well, you have to like walk the walk. If you tell your employees not to steal, you know, don't live out of the corporate checkbook. Right. Yeah. And that's one thing that we've been really talking about, or we've been seeing a lot of, especially, I mean, we've been in this time with, um, with the PPP and the EIDL loans now, um, that these won't be around for forever, but you know, there's been that real, a sense of people being confused because commingling of personal and business seems to be very common. So, um, one thing that Jeff Grant had mentioned in our interview, and we will like put a link above if you guys, and we'll put it in the description box below. Um, but he had said, you know, there was a very thin veil between personal and business. And I just, that sticks with me because I think that is so common that there was almost no veil in some places where, you know, the the personal expenses of the business owner get kind of pulled into the um, into the business, and like this is that this is that whole thing of you are leading by example when your employees see you doing that, and so they are saying if he's doing it or she's doing it, why can't I do it? And that's where that rationalization piece comes in and um, we'll try to get a graphic of the fraud triangle because I think it's super helpful for people to see but really what what the fraud triangle is is you need to have all three in place all three things opportunity to commit the crime um, rationalization on why you think it's okay to commit the crime and then pressure that there's some reason forcing you to have to do that Um, because most people you know if you have $5 sitting on the counter doesn't necessarily mean you're going to take it. If you don't have any, I mean, doesn't necessarily mean just because it's there that you're going to take it. There has to be some other reasons that go on up here to then take the $5 and put it in your pocket. And that's just an example. Obviously we're talking about much bigger sums of money than just $5. Um, but, but I think start with $5, there's yes. a woman in Wisconsin who she was making less than $11 an hour working for a school district. And she said, the first time I stole, it was only $10 and nobody noticed. So Mm -hmm. that five or $10, if you, you know, I don't like the whole broken windows. You have to just cut it off then. But I also kind of think like, if they do that, what next will they do? Mm -hmm. Because it's never a check for 500 grand. It starts small and it hockey pucks. 
Right. Hockey sticks, not hockey yeah. pucks. Hockey, <laughs> hockey sticks. Yeah, it goes whoop. Um, well, I think that's interesting too, because those little things that happen, I think you might even have an example of like a Costco purchase or something in the book yeah. where, you know, maybe you have an office administrator who is um, going to Costco and they come back with all their office supplies and then, oh, they actually have like a pair of jeans in there and you're, you're going, why? There should be no jeans in the Costco purchase. That is not a business expense. There's no reason that this person needed to buy jeans. And then they would have been like, oh, I'm just going to, you know, pay the company back or, you know, it's it's not a big deal. I was just there anyway. So I just brought the, je you know, I put the jeans on the cre company credit card, whatever um, that happens. But then once you start to realize, once that admin realizes like, oh, I can either just make the Costco purchases bigger or maybe while I'm at Costco, I'll go ahead and fill up my car with gas because, hey, I just I just took a trip for the business. You know, this is where it starts to go it's very easy to make those jumps when you don't have some overarching kind of um, controls in place and nobody's looking at it. It's those, those leaps happen very quickly, right? Oh yeah. The velocity, there's a, there's a, an accounting professor um, who's known for, it's really technical Benford's law. And one of the things he also looks at is velocity and it is that hockey stick and it just, you know, again, data analytics, being able to see the velocity, it's like once they get away with it, it it's, you know, it's like, wow, I'm going to town. Mm -hmm. And, and I think one thing to maybe bring up now would be this is not necessarily even people that are criminals who are like snuck into your business. And then now they're trying to perpetrate this, you know, bigger scheme. We, you kind of say like, sometimes good people do bad things. So maybe you can go on that for a second. That, you know, that's my thing. You're in the Seattle area. And actually, mm -hmm. I started my law enforcement career as a special agent for U.S. Customs in Seattle, Washington. So okay. I'm very fond of Seattle. <laughs> and um, uh, I caught bad guys like money launderers, drug dealers, pedophiles. And then, you know, fast forward, life happens. I end up working in a sheriff's office and I'm working for their fraud team and we're working garden variety embezzlement cases on Main Street. And I looked at my suspects and they were all women except for one man who stole like a woman. And it changed my view of criminals mm -hmm. because they are criminals, yet they're women. And again, in my case, they were almost all women. Um, that I would have had lunch with, I would have gone and had a glass of wine with. They don't look bad. I mean, I can show you picture after. I, I could literally show you pictures and you as like, guess the guess the felon. And you'd probably be wrong. Mm -hmm. And um, because they look like this. And there's a great um, crime reads does a thing about by looking normal, the Ted Bundy and Bernie Madoff were able to commit horrific crimes. Mm. So they just kind of go under the radar. So that's that's how things change. Like if you have children and you're in a mall and you say to your kid, if you get separated from me, Johnny, go look for the nice lady. And if you see a scary guy, scream and run. Well, the nice lady might rob you blind. <laughs> so we have these sort of ideas of what crime looks like and pink collar crime doesn't look like what you think it looks like. And that's the other thing is um, the devastation from these crimes mm. mentally, emotionally is so much more than the money. I just had an attorney who had a trusted partner knew from the, when the kid was in high school steal a bunch of money from him. And he's like, I am devastated. He goes, I look at a spreadsheet and eight hours later, I wake up. He's so devastated. He doesn't know what to do. Like literally I should become a licensed clinical social worker to help mm -hmm. these people because we don't know what to do. Like it's worse than a spouse cheating on you because they cheated on you and they stole your money. Yeah. <sighs> Oh my goodness. Yeah, I know that's, and, and that, that's the thing that shocked me so much as reading these stories is the amounts of money too, that are able to be siphoned off for, because sometimes this happens for years and years and years and years and years and years. I mean, 15, 20, 30 years of, you know, even if it's small amounts over time, I mean, it could be millions of dollars. And if it's, if it's small enough and it doesn't like, 
you know, raise any flags, you know, the business will just keep operating because they've always had to make tons of money because they didn't realize they had this huge leak. And so they're operating in this way. And I, th I think that's what really just shocks me about it is that this is not, you know, $10,000 going missing. This can be $20 million. This can be $5 million. This can be, I'm, um, you know, the, um, all the queen's horses movie. Um, we'll link that too. If we can find a link to that movie. Um, that's a really interesting one that had, I, she stole like $50 million or something. 53.7. You Ronald remember, Reagan, yes. <laughs> Ronald Reagan's hometown of trust but verify, and they literally trusted her and never verified. Yes, yeah. So that um, that concept of trusting but verifying, I think, is what one thing we'll talk about when we um, really get into how do we, you know, we don't want to just build up this conversation and say, oh, you look, everybody's stealing from you. Good luck and run away. <laughs> so our next um, our next conversation that we're going to get into is really how do we protect ourselves as business owners and still operate in this way of you know operating a small business where we don't have whole internal audit teams that can help us prevent these things. So um, this has been super helpful, I think, to kind of lay the foundation for pink, pink collar crime and the next conversation we're going to have, we're going to get into how we protect ourselves, how we can identify some of these things and really what we can do to be a little bit more enabled and empowered as small business owners. So thank you, Kelly, for this. This is super helpful and looking forward to the next conversation. Thank you. All right. Well, that was super helpful, but I don't want you guys to get too concerned um, without we're going to give you some practical tips in the next video. This is going to be a two part interview series with Kelly because um, this information is so valuable. We didn't want to just leave you with, hey, pink color crime happens and then not give you any actual help on how to help prevent it. So watch out for the next video. Please make sure you're subscribed and that the little bell notification is also clicked so that when that video comes out, you will be notified. All right. Well, thank you everybody. And we'll see you soon.